remember, please remember that when things get rough, you can always leave over there and come here to Sankofa Books and sit down and relax. Because this is the liberation space and the liberation zone. some visuals as well, but before we show them to you, we would like to say a few words about our organization, which will also reflect very much on the situation of black people in Austria. The association that we um, co-founded, that we founded, was, is called Pamuja, and um, Pamuja means together in Swahili, and this is the very the, this is at the very center of our organization's idea. Um, the starting point for black people in Austria, especially young black people in Austria, is the fact of being isolated from each other. It's an experience of being um, the only black child in school, the only black child in kindergarten, the only black child in, um, in society, basically. Um, Another factor is also there is a very strong visibility of black stereotypes in Austria. There's a long tradition of racist stereotypes in Austria which are not, which are completely denied. If you ask um, like, um, about racism in Austria, people would say there is no racism in Austria. There might be racism in France or in England, but in Austria there is no racism. And another point is also there's the myth that because Austria didn't have any colonies in Africa, that's why there is no stereotypes against black people. But just to, show, um, to give you a few examples of growing up in Austria, it is not that you don't have any images of black people. You have <coughs> racist, stereotypical images about um, black people. You would, for example, as a child, encounter um, a game called Who's Afraid of the Black Man? And it goes like nobody, but what we do? What do we do when he comes? We run away. That's like a cashing game, like in the kindergarten. Another one is um, the song Ten Little Ends. It's a song that goes like first there's ten ends and then they um, nine, eight until they all disappear. And this is something we still have in children books. The N word is still in school books. Um, and. There's also another factor that in the core of the culture of Austria, which is um, Vienna is very much known for operas, like you know Vienna operas, and this is something Vienna is very much known for. And interestingly enough, the two most popular operas that are still played uh, do have stereoty uh, stereotypes about black people. There's one that is um, used as introduction, as an introduction for children. If they are introduced to the opera, they go and see the magic flute. That's how it's called. And in this magic flute, there's a character called Monostatos. And this, this character, he's a black man, and he's every, he embodies every cliche of a black man. He is bad, he is ugly, he's black, and he is, um, he's desiring a white woman and endangering her through that. And he's also dangerous. So this is something that is um, that people are really socialized with, and at the same time, it's complete. It's made very invisible. It is very hard for us to um, kind of um, embrace this experience in a few words. So what we try to do is also bring images as well to show you um, a few of. Um, of the experiences and what you see just before me, I don't know if everyone can see, but I could, yeah. 
I can just I can just describe it. Sorry. I could just describe it. Um, you see, another reality in Vienna is there is racist slurrings at at the walls of houses, and you read things like um, "end out" or "kill ends," and it's something that that would be sprayed on the walls. And it's one thing that it's sprayed on the walls, but it's another thing that it's not being um, how do you call it? It's not being removed. It's not being removed. So on this um, this image here is. Um, uh, image that Pomoja did. You see um, a sister that's Abisar Mahold, another activist, in front of a racist slurring saying "end out," and she's um, she's holding the black fist as a sign of resistance. And this image is called "Here to Stay." Now, what we would like to start with is a video that we did. Um, it's a song that was written, it's called Let It Be Known. It's a rap song. And it is based on a research that we did. It's a research group that we founded. It's called Research Group on Black Austrian History. It's a working group of Pomoja. And there was a, there was a project that researched the hidden, the very much hidden history of the African presence back in the 18th century in Austria. And this project involved young black people, and it was important for us to research our own history because this was something that was very much thought of being impossible. As we're talking to now, even today now, to be um, black and Austrian is a contradiction in itself. It is completely um, something that's unheard of for black people to speak German and to be in. Austria or Germany. So you are in a place where you're not supposed to be. You exist and you're not supposed to exist in a way. So if it's such a contradiction that there's black people here in Austria today, you can imagine how much more impossible it is thought to be that there has been black people in the 18th century. But this very fact that we knew that there's ancestors, there have been ancestors in the 18th century who walked these roads before us was something that was very empowering for us and it really changed a lot of things. Now, um, the video is based on the work of um, Dominic Mario Chukwu, a brother from Nigeria who worked as coordinating MC. For us it was important that we don't just write the history but you, we also tell the history and we make it accessible. And he um, coordinated um, four other MCs who used research as an artistic strategy. And so you see um, five different verses that were all written by, by the MCs. And the video that was done is a video that tried to go into the question of, um, we know what kind of images we don't want to have, the cliche images we don't want to have, but we try to implore the question, what, are, what could be empowering images for us? What could be images that we want to create about ourselves? Um, I will go more into detail, or we will bo both go more into detail after seeing the video. Um, maybe just quickly we will um, translate some parts. It's um, in four languages. Oh, is it four languages? Yeah. It's in German, in English, Swahili, and Lingala. It was also very important for us that it's not, we're not just using colonial languages, but also African languages. Um, that was a very important point. So I think what we'll do is just show the video if that's possible. <coughs> Thank you. 
Too easy to us to be born To this place that's what you might as well Call it a war For everyone, doesn't matter if you're rich or you're poor The only reason why I'm just to get this message across Cause we just don't want to teach what we want to be taught For example, I just saw the lens Ain't that food for thought Let it be known the fellas since the start African queens come on these not reality No longer an African dream Please be attention The situation's going out of hand Causing so much frustration Not to mention discrimination And criminalization It's just another Like everywhere, I guess, around um, in that diaspora, there are very strong stereotypes about black people portrayed in the media. And in the Austrian context today, what is the, the most popular, strongest stereotype is um, black men being drug dealers and um, black women being prostitutes. And it's, it's like a, um, how do you say, equation? It's like um, if you talk about drug dealers, you don't need to mention that it's a black man. It's imagined already. So it's already one picture. Drug dealer equates, is that right, equates? Mm -hmm. <laughs> equates with, sorry. Equates with, um, with black men. And um, concerning black women, um, the stereotype of black women being prostitutes is something that is reflected in everyday life. You just harassed in public, offered, um, you know, just being seen in public as prostitute. Um, now, the stage press conference was something that the group worked out, the kind of um, dreaming of being able to tell it to the public, the other way around, to be, you know, not to be an object but a subject. And I don't know, it was very fast, but in the English part, um, brother um, Item 7, that's his artist name, he mentioned, I'm not your monostatus. And I mentioned before, monostatus, the figure in the opera, so that's the way we, we wanted to talk about it, as in, from a resistant point of view. Talk about oppression, but at the same time, from an opposing point of view. Um, there is um, there's another um, there's another dimension in the video is that the different MCs chose their topics and also we um, try to um, create empowering situations and there's one situation where you see Ramiz that was quite in the beginning uh, the brother that said um, our fellow sisters are African queens if you remember that and there was a classroom situation that very much reflects the experience of growing up in Austria, like I mentioned before, being the only black child in classroom. And Njedeka would like to um, employ this topic of school. Yeah, the opening scene is um, Brother Ramiz. Uh, he talked very much from his own perspective as a, a student in class. Um, Growing up in Austria, going to school, not very much is taught about African history. But I think many of us know that in different contexts as well, that we're not taught very much of our own, about our own history. And um, when, when you do talk about black realities, it's something that is always put very much outside Austria. It's something that is, um, we talk about the enslavement of Africans and, and place it to the Americas and so on. It's something that is not is not um, thought in an Austrian context. So on the one hand, um, you are the exception. As, as was said earlier, you're a contradiction because you exist. And on the other hand, what you are taught is um, Africa's underdeveloped and um, needs to be educated, needs to be... Um, uh, well, 
Yeah, rescued, rescued exactly. Mm -hmm. And um, in different lessons, in geography lessons, in history lessons, there's something that you get to hear a lot. And it's something that where you're in a situation where other classmates will always turn around and look at you because you you kind of represent every black person. You represent Africa, so there's a lot that is expected from you as well. And um, uh, something that Rami said is that for him, uh, finding out about his own history made him able to stand and say, this is who I am and this is where I'm going. So um, uh, for, for, for young black children also, um, who we've shown the video to in the community, even um, kids that were just in kindergarten, it was something that was so empowering for them to see um, other black people in a position um, that was not these stereotypical images. And um, just to know that they're not alone, and I think that's something that I don't know if you can imagine what it's like to, you know, to be in a situation where there's just there's not a single black person anywhere um, near you. So um, that's something that we used also for kids. It's something it's a video that um, that has been very um, helpful and empowering for for children to see a reflection of themselves, and um, also for the MCs themselves. It was a it was a journey. The whole the whole. Um, uh, um, Put, putting together the ideas and really choosing their own um, strengths and perspectives. Um, like um, at the end, um, Judo talks about um, defining ourselves and being stripped of um, stripped of our cu um, culture and names, um, specifically in an Austrian context in the 18th century. Um, um, what that meant, um, there was a form of, of, of an enslavement in, in Austria. Was people were um, um, taken away from um, from from Africa and brought to um, the courts of the of, of Vienna, where they where they were servants. And there's a part where um, um, item seven says most brothers were runners and sisters were maids, and um, that talks about the role of um, of. Uh, uh, black men who usually would run in front of the carriages in Vienna and, and make space um, for, for, for the carriages and do those things. And very often young black children were given as gifts for emperors and um, anybody at, on, on, on the courts and really just used as playthings, you know, just used as toys and very much. So um, these are things that um, what, what uh, all rolled into the song, but at the same time um, there's always a a counter position to it, so it's not something that is just left there. And um, just um, so, just knowing that um, other brothers and sisters uh, not only existed but resisted at that time. I mean, we're not talking about big um, demonstrations or a, commu a community, but in their very own way, they um, resisted. And yeah, and I think it's. Um also shows this, there was exactly in, in like Sister Njadeka already said, in Rami's part, he says, he also says, um, um, teachers don't want to teach what we want to be taught, like Angelus, Angela Soliman, ain't that food for thought? And Angela Soliman um, is the most known black figure in the, um, black person in the 18th century that lived in Austria. And his story is, like Sister Njadeka already mentioned, part of a bigger story of um, experience of black people uh, in the 18th, 18th century being um, brought to Austria and being also survivors of the Middle Passage in Austria. They were um, used as, like already mentioned, as um, play toys. It, so it was not, uh, and they were not um, in the sense of um, plantation slavery, uh, enslaved in that sense, but it was a different form of oppression. And in the story of Angela Soliman, he, um, lived in Vienna, he married a white woman in Vienna, and um, he moved up in the hierarchy of society in Vienna, but after his death, he was stuffed and exhibited in the emperor's um, museum. But he was not the only black person. There was another um, African child, um, she's supposed to be like five, six years old, and two other black men that were, ex that were exhibited in that way. And um, what we also found out is that um, Angela Soliman's daughter, Josephine Soliman, fought against her father being exhibited in that way. So there's protest letters of her, and this was a starting point 
for the research of two sisters, um, Claudia Unterweger and Belinda Kasim, who went into the question of um, resistance of our ancestors. Now, the image that you see on the, on the left side, um, maybe it's also a reference that shows you that um, in, the, in the African diaspora, there's a lot of inspiration we get from um, African revolutionaries in, uh, yeah, African American revolutionaries in, in the United States, like for example, uh, Malik Shabazz was. There's this image, um, we call it Angelo X, because Angelo Soliman, we never, we will never know what his name was, the name that was given to him. His name, his first name, Angelo, and also his surname, is a reflection of the U European fantasies. And um, in the original image, you see Angelo Soliman in a turban and a fantasy uniform that's made to be his own. And we remapped Angelo Soliman um, into a political subject. Um, you see him um, with an afro, the black fist up, um, saying black is beautiful. And you see a demonstration, you see the Austrian parliament. And for us the question was, how was it, what did it mean for our ancestors in the 18th century to survive in Vienna? Um, and it meant for Josefine Soliman to fight against her father being exhibited. And what, is, um, what are the struggles today? in um, Austria, Vienna. And just like everywhere in the African diaspora, one very, very um, big reality in, in our oppression is police violence. And um, in the last years, um, in the 90s, what has happened is, is a more and more community campaigning against police brutality. And um, this is something we want to, wanted to picture in this image. I mean, so you see um, a demonstration um, going on. Um, concerning the, the situation of um, the black community in, in um, Austria, what has happened in the 90s was um, that police brutality wasn't something new, but what happened in the 1990s is that it became more and more visible in the mainstream media it became more and more known to the mainstream. And um, there's just, um, there's a few dates, there's two dates that are inscribed in the memory of the black community in Austria. The first date being um, the 1st of May, 1999. Um, that is the date um, on which Marcus Umufuma a young Nigerian was killed during the deportation. He was deported to Nigeria. Um, he was um, um, like on the flight with three policemen on the plane. And he was, maybe you can help me out, he was um, gagged. They, um, they gagged him so he suffocated. So he, he suffocated. Uh, and. This also came out because this didn't happen on Austrian territory, it happened on Bulgarian territory. And this, um, this is something that came out. And in the whole um, justification of um, this police brutality, what I mentioned before, the whole Austrian tradition of racist stereotypes came out, like the comparison of black people with animals, with uh, he was dangerous, he was biting, he was, that we were just defending ourselves, he was, um, he was aggressive. This is something that came out in that, um, in that um, justification. Um, there's a long chain of names um, that died in police custody. But at the same time, and this was um, a big step for the African community to take, there has been um, a process of self-organization and protest. One thing that we have been struggling with very much is um, to free ourselves from accepting this reality as something normal. And also to um, empower black children not to see that as something normal. But if you live in a city where you see and out on the written on the wall, imagine you learn how to read, you put the, la the letters together, and that's how you, that's what you read, that's what's possible to write to be written on a wall, that is something that is very traumatizing. So um, this very fact of um, freeing ourselves from internalized um, 
racism is a very big topic. And sometimes we realize that um, when people come to see us, brothers and sisters from outside of Austria come to see us, the way they react to the racist slurrings sometimes is very much a wake-up call for us. Because we, some, we, yeah, we, we sometimes get so much used to it as something that is not to be changed. Another point in, in, the, in the part of Jutes and Tongo is it's time to define ourselves and not to be defined. That is a very big topic for us in German. German is a language, like I said, in, like we said, um, it, is, it, is a, it is something that is um, a contradiction to be black and speak German fluently. And we grow up in a language that has such a long chain of racist names that have been given to us, but they're not our names. Names that black people have been called throughout history. It goes beyond the 18th century, back to the Middle Ages, there's already been words for black people. Um, there's the N-word, like we mentioned, it's still in the school books, so it's still something that is contested in the classrooms. It's dependent on this one, this this individual white teacher. We have we um, we have um, in Vienna. There's two black teachers. We have, right? Two, yeah. Okay. Um, there's two black teachers that we have, and um, so it is something that still has to be um, discussed in the classroom situation. So what we try to do is empower black children for this very situations. Um, in order to stand up, just like in, you saw in the, vi in the video, Rami standing up in history class and saying it out loud, like the, the history, is something that we try to um, encourage with our work. Um, the process of self-definition um, means for us that we also dare to choose our own names in which we want to be called in German. And um, in a language where we not uh, that we're not supposed to speak, it is a very contested field. I don't know if that makes sense at all, but yeah. Um, in the Ger I mean, there's a, a strong connection also to um, Germany. Um, in the 19, uh, 1986, um, Maya Yim, a sister, um, did a research on the history of black people in Germany, and what she did is she researched. The history that shows the that showed also the colonial um, impact, the col the racism that is still so much um, embedded in the colonialism. German had Germany had colonies in Africa, and um, this is a part of history that is very much hidden. And in Namibia, there has been genocide of the Herero people, and this is something that is completely. Um, out wide, not talked about. And um, my Yim's work is a work that is been, has been very inspiring for us. And it's a legacy that we also um, built our work on. So um, concerning the process of self-definition, it was also Maya Yim and another sister called Katarina Okudoye that published a book called um, Showing Our Colors. Um, Afro-German women, um, it's on Afro-German women and their history. And in this very publication, that was 1986, the self-definition Afro-German came out. And this was a very, um, this laid a big foundation for um, the African diaspora in the German-speaking wor world. And like I mentioned before, it was a contradiction to be black and, and, and German or black and Austrian. So the whole combination of Afro-German is something completely impossible. So this impos making this impossibility possible was something that um, this publication did, but also connected to the publication was, um, was different forms of artistic work as well. There was um, rap songs being written, um, politically conscious rap songs that were written. Um, one band being called uh, Advanced Chemistry, they brought out a so song um, called um, Strange in Your Own Country, and it talks about how you are made to feel, um, made to be, a, um, made to be, feel like a stranger in your own country, in the country uh, of your birth. 
and this also um, led to the definition being spread more and more. Um, in, the, in our, in our um, Austrian context, there's different political positions as how we should define ourselves. There's um, positions that embrace the term African-Austrian, but then there's also Pan-Africanist positions that contest the notion of, um, of um, identifying with Austria as a country as well and simply calling ourselves African. So as a group, we do have, I think, it's, it's, we have to say that there's not one definition. It's very highly dramatically discussed. It's a point of, of um, I think it's, it's been very deeply discussed. Um, so it's not, there's not one um, definition on that. Um, what I would um, like to, um, to um, you to listen now is, is a song that was written in 2003. I mentioned the first date, um, like two dates uh, being um, dates that are inscribed in the memory of the, of the African community in, in Vienna, and the first date being the 1st of May, 1999. There's a second date, which is the 15th of July in 2003, and this was, um, the date on which um, a brother called Shebane Wagwe, he, um, he came from Mauritania, and that was the day, um, the date of his death. He died in, um, in an African village. It was a village that was reconstructed in, um, in Vienna as a, a point, a cultural meeting point. And, um, there was a video that showed the way he died, and this very video brought realities into light that, as usually, really contradicted what, what, what the public communicated before of, of, of his reason of, of death. Um, Shebony Wagwe was, um, and the video shows that Shebony Wagwe was, um, he lay on the floor and there was nine people that stood on him, and those were police men, one police woman and medics, and there was um, as I know that this emergency doctor. He was standing beside um, the scene, and um, he didn't. Um, yeah, he didn't rescue him. So this this reality, what happened on the fifteenth of July, two thousand and three, was for the black community also another dimension of violence because this also included medics. It was not just the police, but also medics. The f initially, the, in the media, it was reported that he, um, he had a weak heart. I think that's a very common reason for black men to die. And um, like at least officially, and um, yeah, and, and he was full of drugs. And then when the video came out, there was a witness who, who shot this video. Um, this reality was brought into light. At the same time, and this is something that the song also shows, is um, there was, after, this, after his death, what happened is um, a platform was called into life, a platform called Justice for Sheba Niwagwe. So um, there was also a form of resistance that um, came into being after his death. Um, I hope it will work out. It's a song called um, Die For Nothing, and it was written by a brother called Prince Seker. And this song is dedicated to Shirane Wagwe, and it was written in this, um, in this process of, of um, in this movement of resistance against um, state malpractice. Um, to hear all the lyrics, but uh, we will try to like what he says is that um, I think the the refrain was was here about so many brothers and sisters are dying, but what he also said is um, the question who has the right to take somebody's life, and um, yeah, yeah. So this is just he says once again another brother died died for nothing. Who has the right to take somebody's life? 
um, I would just like to, to um, read you a few names of, of um, black people that have died in Austria under police custody. Oh, and Jadeka will read them out. In 2005, on the 4th of October, Jan Kuba Sisse from Gambia. In 2005, Ben Habra from Algeria. In 2004, Edwin, Ed, Edwin Ndupu from Nigeria. Nicole J. Shibani Owage. Bilal Ilta. Johnson Okpara. Richard Ibekwe. Marcus Omofuma. Ahmed F, Sharif Hussein Ahmed, and Jerry Johnson. Um, we had wanted to show you also the video that I talked about, the, wit the witness video that showed how um, Marcus Umufuma was, uh, I'm not Marcus Umufuma, how Shiva Niwagu was um, killed in the Africa village. But I think for I think we'll just leave that out at this point. I think it's technically um, difficult. Um, I would still like to return to the history of protest in, in the African diaspora. Um, the moment where the, um, the African di uh, communities decided to protest was politically a very important moment, the notion that was very strong before that was a notion of thankfulness. Um, thankfulness in the sense of um, something that we very much got from our parents' generation. Be thankful that you are in Europe and that you have the opportunity to get a good education. So um, don't complain. And we should be happy that we are allowed to be here. So we should be thankful for that. So breaking out of this thankfulness to going to the streets and protesting for our rights was a very dramatic and big step. Now, um, the way uh, the protest organized itself was um, through um, a network of African communities. That how, that's how we called it. And it was a cooperation of different community organizations. It was Pamoja, but at the same time also Panafa, the Pan-African Forum in Austria, um, Amirza, the Union of the Togolese. I mean, these are very much details, but still there were different unions. The way the, the community was organized, or is still organized, is that there are national um, unions, I mean, of the different African uh, nations, like. Nigerian, there's a very strong um, Nigerian um, community, and this Nigerian community has organized itself um, in various ways. There's Yoruba unions, there's Igbo unions, but there's also an uh, umbrella union of the Nigerian community. There's a strong Ghanaian um, union and community, um, Togolese um, from Congo, Zaire, is there anything else? From Senegal as well, Gambia. And then on the other hand, there's also unions that work on a pan-African level, not just based on, on uh, nations, but on a pan-African level, which is Panafa Pamoja, for example. There's also a black woman union. Now, um, this network of African communities um, organized themselves. Uh, we organized protests, and we also organized demonstrations in front of the home office, because for us, when Marcus Umafuma died, when all those brothers died, and it was, um, uh, we protested on racism on an institutional level. So it was about the political responsibility. Um, then what happened in 1999 is, um, in 1999, um, Austria saw the then biggest police raid in the Second Republic of Austria. And this police raid was called Operation Spring. And this very Operation Spring had as a target black people, especially black men. And there was um, more than 100 people in prison, more than 100 Africans in prison. And it was the first time that um, a witness that was anonymous was used in court. So, um, what this operation, this, this, uh, this um, police raid did, it, 
is um, it's criminalized the political protest of the African community against police state malpractice as part of the criminal organization. Um, we, uh, what I brought here with me is, um, this is like a map full of um, newspaper clips and it says, for example, um, the headline in the newspaper was, um, maybe you can help me translate it. Nigerian drug ring busted. Um, hundreds of asylum seekers um, were arrested in Vienna, in Graz, in Linz, and in St. Burton. And, yeah. and what, um, in, in the media construction, this was something that was on national TV, it was all around the newspapers. And what was done is that um, one of our activists, Charles Ofo, um, Ofoedu, who was very active in, in the community protests, he was constructed as the head of this drug, um, of this alleged um, drug, how do you call it, drug ring. So he was constructed as a big drug boss, and he was in prison for three months. Now he um, wrote down his experiences while being in prison, and unfortunately this book is only in German, but there is notions of translate, translating that as well. Um, this very police operation was, in fact, um, something that really worked on a political level on really crimi like criminalizing the protest. And it also worked so well because of what we mentioned initially, the equation black men um, equates with drug dealer. So an effective war on drugs would be a war on black people. So this was used um, politically, and interestingly enough, this was a marking point of the African community of black people in Austria being seen as part of the society, but in a criminalized way. So for the first time, um, this came up on in a topic in, um, in, um, in election camp campaigns. First, black people were not really seen as, as uh, part of this country, but um, through, uh, from this time on, this was also used in election campaigns as topic that um, we need to do something against. Um, um, and this is also very specific. There's also very specific um, stereotype against Nigerians, a Nigerian drug connection. That's something that's very strong. Um, this, um, um, this Operation Spring had a very severe impact in the community. It really, dem it really um, crushed down the protest on so many different levels because there was a very classical um, element of betrayal within the community. There was an anonymous witness that um, says belasted? accused um, different members of the community um, so it took a very long time for the community to, to recover from that. And like I mentioned before, it was something that was, um, that was um, very much present in the media. And it was very difficult to contest that, um, to, that to break that very image. Um, something that is... Um, Today, like in, in as we're talking today at the moment, a very um, a very um, oppressive reality is that the asylum laws have been sharpened to a very dramatic extent, and this leads to um, existences being criminalized. And this is a point that Sister Jadeka is is um, focusing on and wants to talk about. In, in 2006, there was a new uh, law in force. They call it a new law, but as if the old one would have been so um, open and, 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 and um, easygoing law on, on, on um, people of color in general. I mean, um, yes, uh, 2006 it was enforced, which meant there was a new asylum law. And um, the, um, the thing is that um, Austria having this uh, Nazi history, at the same time you could really see things in this law re that were ref that reflected certain steps they took in laws in previous laws, and because in um, Austria very many laws were were written in in the Nazi time that were just um, continued as such, they weren't they were not renewed, 
And um, one aspect of this is, for example, that um, uh, asylum seekers uh, can easily be taken into detention and, and they prolong the time of detention before deportation. And um, one thing that um, many asylum seekers did in that time was to go on a, hung a hunger strike because that's also a way of being released. And so now in this law, they officially have, um, um, a f you c they are people who can be force fed, which is actually um, seen as a form of, um, sorry, I just only have the German word in my head at the moment. Um, it, uh, I'll tell you, uh, a form, um, when, yeah. Torture. torture, thank you. It's a form of torture and it's officially allowed and they, they use a different name, like a medical name for it. So um, it gets this, it's what happened a lot in the Nazi times as well. You had these um, terms that were made, that were used as um, medical um, terms. And um, on top of that, um, apart from the asylum law being um, a lot stricter, um, I mean, generally asylum seekers are criminalized as drug dealers and as people who want to, to um, uh, use the system. So um, at the same time, very many, um, uh, maybe loopholes are made quite impossible. And um, the migration law in general, um, they've made it impossible for a European, um, European nationals to marry anybody who's like non-european i mean um they've uh, the um, anyone who marries someone non-european is immediately reported to the police and all the data goes to the police and these people are usually sometimes they can um, bust in on a wedding and arrest someone or they can um, then um, take someone into detention later and um the, um, the amount of money that you ha have to be able to earn to even have um, to, to be able to apply for a visa is made quite impossible for, for most people. So these laws um, mainly affect, I mean, they say it in general that it's every non-European, but I think that if, an, um, I don't know, um, an, a white Australian um, married an, an Austrian, I think that they probably would be able to get a visa a lot easily. So you can see who is um, criminalized and who is affected by this law. And it's something that, um, um, we also, because our group is so diverse, because we have on the one hand people who were born in Austria um, 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 and um, other people who have just been here for three years and really are affected by this. So this is something we um, also really take seriously as part of the black reality because, um, yes, many, many brothers and sisters are, in, uh, are taken into detention and um, deported. And the, also the whole concept of deport deportation is exactly the term that was used in the Nazi era. So once again, you have um, something like this also being reproduced and used as if it were a word that, that didn't mean anything and didn't carry any kind of history in Austria. Yeah, I think we talked a lot. Um, and I think we would just like to stop here and just um, engage a discussion. And um, yeah, at this point, I think we'll... Yeah, uh, again, let's first thank them. And uh, we, have a lot, we have lots of uh, things to still do, but we felt now uh, you need to be involved. And uh, go ahead. I have a question. Um, how, do you, how do you draw the connections personally, and then how do you get other people to draw the connections? between isolated events, like you when you use your police brutality, how you get just the average population to see the connections between one brother being murdered by the police and how that affects the, the community as a whole? Because some people just be like, well, that's just that one, and that doesn't affect me. So how you draw making that connection? Um, that's a very big question. I mean, um, it's, there's two levels to it. On the one hand, there is, there's also, what happens a lot of times is there's also an, em, an emotional connection. It happens often with, um, we see that um, sometimes with, with black kids that feel very insecure that this is something that could be me or my uncle or my daddy and this happens to him and nothing happens. So there is already a notion of um, insecurity as such. Um, but at the same time, we, we, have to be, um, we have to be realistic. There is, we can't reach everyone. And there is some people that, are, um, there's brothers and sisters who are just um, saying that um, it doesn't concern me. And we had discussions of people saying that, well, Shebani, he must have done something. 
he must have done something to to be dying like that. So there is this reality of, of um, brothers and sisters saying that, yeah, it must have been his fault as well. So um, what we focus more is, is, is young people, which, um, which makes, um, yeah, which sometimes makes it more possible to, um, to reach out on that, on that level. But we don't have really a recipe how to really make this, you know, break this connection down to people who have gone so far to say that it's his own fault. Thank you. Uh, my, my question is, is about the African population. Is there, I'd like to know more about uh, the African population. Those that are born there, number-wise, those that are born, those that are, uh, uh, that are coming in from other countries, who are they mainly located in Germany? And in comparison with the overall all population of Germany, what is the percentage of people of color? You want to, by the way, they're from Austria, ah. yet they also know the German situation, so we can know that there's two situations here. Um, it's Talking about numbers in an Austrian context is always very difficult because, um, because of the history, you know, pe um, because of the Nazi history specifically, where people were really counted and, and, and um, traced back um, if they were Jewish or not, and who was, so, so this is something that, um, that we that we also um, on the one hand that not many uh, not many numbers as such exist because they they also don't have um, count how do you say you you don't um, it's not racial set yeah by race exactly on by race as such it's it's um, you can talk about how many continental Africans with an, an African passport are in Vienna. These are the numbers that they they collect. But how many um, black people or people of African descent is something that is not um, is not registered. And so, but they say that around ten thousand in Vienna, or is, or, and Vi yeah, the, in the they're mainly in, in in Vienna, like in the biggest cities. The capital is Vienna. Then you have this um, second biggest city in in Styria is is, is um, Graz. And um, you have Linz, and um, then it gets. You have Innsbruck, which is, which is quite rural. So it's mainly focused um, in in Vienna. But there are strong communities in Graz and in Linz who are also very active. And, oh, yeah. From um, the the strongest population, I think, is Nigeria, Egypt, Egypt yeah, and, and Ghana. Um, so we have a stronger, um, re more recent movement from Ga from Gambia, from Senegal, and not as many actually. Not Some, yes. not yeah. Germany. Yeah. Germany. In, we have East Africa as as yeah, in, uh, Namibia mainly in Germany. Yeah. Uh, in terms of population, um, he was asking, you know, just size wise, how many the African <laughs> folks in general, and the, the um, born, Austrian born Africans and African Americans, is their population, I thought we were, you knew at least the, the estimation of Africans in Austria. 10,000, yeah. With African passports. With African passports, but that doesn't tell us how many people are born there or. Oh, I see. Go ahead, sister, I'll come to you. I have a question. I know another Germany, Austria sort of parallel. I know in Germany there are particular laws related to uh, what you can name your child. And when you go to register your child legally, there's a book that you, you have to choose the name that's a traditional German name. Is that the same in Austria? Can you name your child whatever you want or does it have to be a, a German name? It doesn't, it doesn't have to be a German name, but there have been there have been problems like um, there was one brother who um, named his child and had to go to the Institute for Anthropology, I mean Culture and Social Anthropology, and, um, and you know, uh, the anthropologist had to tell him, yes, the name actually exists in Ghana, and it's, the, you know, so that, that, that does happen as well. But, um, I, I mean, there is, there is quite a tight um, knowledge connection of people that have um, 
um, undergone this struggle of naming so people really connect with each other how did you do it whatever so that's very tight across like in Germany and Austria so parents really link like really work on this topic and know what and how to go to to um, to do that but it is well let me ask you Araba and you uh, in terms of your names when did you take it when did you register it where did you get it your names, how did it come about? How were you named? When did, did you name? There's a lot of folks in America who changed their name. Okay. And how is it in terms of naming Africans and what is the culture of naming? And how did you personally name you? you know? um, with me, because I have a Ghanaian passport and it's in my passport, but my, my first name is a Christian name, which is Evelyn. And I decided to take Arab as my first name. And this is something that's very common now in the community that um, a lot of, um, a lot of brothers and sisters um, with African parents choose to take their soul name, their African soul name as first name. So that, that's, a, that's a practice that is done, just like Kwame Nkrumah did, you know. So that is a legacy that we, we also take. And it's something that is um, also part of our, our mental colonization is that the fact of being ashamed of also speaking your African languages because you just want to slide in and disappear and speak German. And sometimes, even also with the parent generation, it's good to be integrated and to get along in Austria. So speak colonial languages, just English and German. So this is a project we've been dreaming of to really, um, not just, yeah, to really um, create a big understanding for, for African languages. And it starts with the names, very much with the names. Um, yeah, I, my my first name is um, Stephanie Njideka is my second name, so I also um, just, um, ch chose that as as a name I want to be called, and it's it's a yeah, and uh, very often people just ignore it, so it's something that you really have to so use parents, a lot very strongly. My, my and my dad name uh, my my dad and my, um, ch chose Njideka, so yeah. Um, I had a, I'm not sure how long you've been here on, in, on your trip to the States thus far, but when you talked about this character, Monostasus, is that how you pronounce it? Um, it reminded me of the very recent controversy about LeBron James on the cover of Vogue with Giselle Bündchen, who's actually half German. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. If you are, I wanted to know what your thoughts are. But if not, I wanted to know to what extent do you think that black people are responsible for the portrayal of their own images in the media? Well, could you also really speak your view on it? Because sure. we don't want to just a tip for type question. What, what is that issue to you? Well, just to briefly explain the LeBron James issue, he was he's a, a fam famous basketball player here in the NBA who posed on, the first African American actually, and the third male to pose on, on Vogue, which is a very popular magazine here, um, for the first time. But the way in which the pose, he was, you know, in his, um, how he normally poses on the court with kind of like a scowl on his face with a basketball in his hand mm -hmm. and the regular NBA attire. But then he had Giselle Bündchen, who's a supermodel on one arm, who's just in, in a very elegant dress and she's smiling while he's scowling. And for a lot of people that brought up the image of King Kong and, you know, holding the damsel in distress, it was very similar to that kind of imagery. And we talk about sort of this menacing African American who's sort of attacking this white woman. Now, it wasn't the person Ann Leibovitz, who's a famous photographer, you know, she took this picture and, and it's been talked about on CNN and everybody has their different views. LeBron James himself says that he, you know, he was just having fun. He didn't see it as sort of an impressive image. But there are a lot of people who say just because he didn't doesn't necessarily mean it isn't. And that's sort of the view that I take. You know, unfortunately, in the states as well as you know, obviously worldwide, black people have always been portrayed in these in these images, and and just because he's the first male to be on Vogue, I mean, the fact that this, you know, that it was portrayed in that way sort of takes away from that. Mm -hmm. And some people say that you know, it's to the individual to sort of take ownership of their image in the media. So I just wanted to hear if you guys had any thoughts on that as well. I mean. Um this this been I mean this is a very strong topic uh, like has always been a very strong topic but um, the world of images is a very political field and um, one thing that we've also always um, discussed of, um, on is is that this world of images this 
image regime doesn't only have an impact how others see us, but also how we see ourselves. So this um, is the first point of, like Bob Marley said, we need to um, free ourselves from mental slavery because no one but ourselves can free our minds. So this is the starting point in a way. So obviously we also reproduce it, obviously. And we need to take responsibility for that. But I think it's bigger than just this one brother having a good time. I mean, it's, it's in a bigger picture. That's how um, I would see it. And that's also a process of freeing ourselves from that. And for example, when we did the rap video, it was difficult to really think of images that we want to have. It was easier to say that we don't want to have the image of black women being just over-sexualized and as object. But what would be then an empowering image of black women? That was a question that it's not answered. It was one video that we did, but something to think of. It's not so much easier. You have all this um, cliche image to throw on, but what are really liberating images? You really have to look for them. And we did very much look for them um, also in the States, like, um, as, um, like empowering images of, of the revolutions here. But in Austria, we didn't really have so much reference to that. So I think, I don't know if that answers your call. If, that answers your question. Well, including people like you and people who think like you, what do the other black people think of us here? Um, what do other black people there? Not people like you, not the ones who think like you do, the oh, no, others. The general How do they feel about us? The general view. Yes. Of, are you talking about Austrians in general or Africans in Austria? I'm talking about black how people. do, yes, how black do black people, people living in Austria like who are not thinking like you feel about black people in America? That's a big one. Where to start? Um, where to start? Um, okay, there's this one thing that is is quite um, uh, dominant as well. Is is for example. Um, African parents being worried about this American style that the children, you know, they think they're in America and they uh, and, and and black children not having uh, um, like um, cool models, role models, cool people in their own context. So the cool people are in the states, they're in the videos, mm -hmm. so they dress like them and talk like them. Sometimes even try to talk with an American slang, mm -hmm. and this is something then. Um, in a shortened way, this is, is, is one, um, one thing that um, um, Americans are like, like gangster rap kind of thing and the bad influence and um, bad manners. Um, that, that's one point I can think of in... Is that something? But sometimes it's also something I think that you can position yourselves as, as um, African American or Black American, and then it, you 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 can get away from the African burden a bit as well. I think that's something that is 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 is, is sometimes seen as something different, and 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 made, there's a difference that is made then. Yeah. And what is what is used is is sometimes um, brothers from uh, brothers not just from one country, but. Um, <laughs> I was saying in Nigeria. Okay, um, brothers um, trying to take up an, an American slang because they think it just comes. It, it's more popular. Mm -hmm. It's used kind of in as in, in that way. Um, gen, I mean, that's something. In general, well, I mean, there is a big impact, of course, pop in pop, popular culture um, that has a big impact on how black people are viewed. But I, I can't really think of any other. There's a lot of things, but so quickly, it's hard to really wrap it up. Well, I know one thing that I could add, just because I'm older than everybody, I'm glad I'm here. Uh, one of the things I know, 30 years history of my relationship with black Germans, uh, there's two things African Americans, I think, uh, uh, transport. Uh, one is this, the BET culture that is predominant, and it's kind of body snatched the young, the youth, and it creates parental, in generation uh, conflict. But then the most very interesting thing is the resistance aspect of black America is the inspiration of the world. This duality, the inspiration of the world also, when African Americans stand up to power, they are imitative, uh, they inspire a whole 
global culture. And I think in Germany, what I see is this whole uh, duality that Africans in America, their capacity being in this geographical location to be either negative or positive. I think that's where it breaks down and I stand corrected, but this can maybe help them uh, deal with the issue. But let me, I'll come back to you, my sister. Go over here. I have two questions. One is about the LeBron James Vogue cover. Always when uh, an NBA player is playing and it's kind of insulting. Uh, one year was the, how the Japanese portray uh, people and uh, black people in Germany. And then Jack, in Germany. A picture years ago of Carl Lewis, the runner, mm -hmm. in pink high heels. Yes. Okay. I'm sure if they went to Car uh, Carl and asked him what he think of that picture, he would say, oh, I don't have a problem with it. So if you, they don't have a problem, then if you have a problem, then obviously there's something wrong with your mind. And your interpretation. So either way, if you complain about that picture, you get jacked up. If you don't complain about that picture, you get jacked up. And the image again is promoted, and a, a child assumes that image and thinks that's all right. So then, when he sees that again or another one like it, he can go along with it. And the second thing I want to ask is about the the literature in Aust Austria black people writing in the resistance. And I call it that, uh, Toni Morrison had that on her, uh, on, on one website, uh, the resistance writing all over the African diaspora. And is there a lot of resistance writing of novels uh, uh, in Austria by black people? Mm -hmm. In the schools, colleges, especially, and in popular culture. <laughs> Um, there is, um, like I mentioned, Maya Yim in, in the beginning. She's a sister who who um, who did poetry and dedicated her poetry also very much to to the resistance. Um, it's not something that's out in in schools and colleges yet, but um, it's still something that needs to be shared within the community. Um, and that's something we um, we try to do, but I'm not really sure if I understand you correctly. But if you say resist resistance, you mean resistant literature dedicated to the resistance. Okay. Um, what what has been also a point of of, of resistance is also um, conscious conscious music. There's been um, a collective in Germany called Brothers Keepers that was dedicated that was formed after the death of um, Adriano. They formed a collective and. Um, 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 did an album called um, The Last Warning concerning um, violence and it says like it's a last warning we're going we are patient but if if it continues we're going to hit back and this was something very radical in 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 the German speaking context because it's all about integrating and begging to be part of it and if you didn't say we're going to hit back that was really something um, uh, very uh, like um, that was a breakthrough in this point so Maya Yim is very central in this literature. There's even a um, literature awards that was called into being in 2004. It's called the Maya Yim Awards on literature in Berlin. That was in Berlin. Um, and there is, um, there's other, yeah, there's other literature. There's, for example, the, I mentioned Charles Ufoedu, who wrote a book on his experience in prison, but he's also a poet and a writer. It, there's also a sister called Ishraga Mustafa Hamid. I mean, there's names I can name that would not really sound familiar, but it's... Um, and Araba. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, it is not yet in the colleges. But I, for example, I, did, I do um, courses at the university and I try to bring that in. And also um, Ishraga Mustafa Hamid does. So this we're slowly starting, but our first point is to really share it within the community. The not, I mean, the the literature that is out there. But you also use African American literature, we, African culture. Very much, we very much use Af. I mean, use, but we are very much inspired by African American literature and African. Uh, Maya Angelou, um, so many. Off the cuff is not. She'll come. So many she'll come with that. Think but, about it. Yeah. So Maya doesn't become the first name you want to hear. <laughs> kind of rubs me wrong. So <laughs> just talk to me. Think about it. Just think to me. Um, I, I want to pick up on the comments that you made because it's cross-fertilization. 
discussion of race in this country because it is intended to get us to where you are now in Europe where the numbers are obliterated, the, the images are controlled and, and, um, and stuffed somewhere so that you begin to lose sight of things. Resist this discussion about eliminating race because uh, then you then you don't have uh, a good feel. You don't have the documentation to prove uh, what is being um, done to you. You know, um, so th those are some of the things that, that uh, uh, come to mind um, when when you're speaking, and I, I really do appreciate uh, your coming here and. Something else uh, I intended to say that is, I'm too old to remember it, so I have to come back. <laughs> yeah, um, but thank I'll, you very I'll say much. One thing before I give you my brother the forum, I'll tell you something to the young sister here. I'll tell you, 1967, white people would not have the audacity to put that picture on anything. They were so scared of black people. Now, ask why they couldn't do. Why did they take black people for? Granted now, not only that they've done more things, they're doing going to do more things, that's one. The other thing is black people wouldn't have let them, the kind of black people I knew in Chicago and LA would not have let them, you know, live to see the picture. And I think that should be said about those ancestors who stood and said that when they walked, white people used to in a hallway, used to go on the other side. I was a foreigner, so I was trying like, which, which side should I go? <laughs> but black men, when or women walk with their afro, white folks go in the other direction or let the prince and princesses of revolt pass by before they let them. I, I say that just to add to <laughs> my sister here. Go ahead. The, the, the other point was this whole issue of gratefulness and how, again, we, you know, uh, arguments go back and forth. Um, there was a quiet uh, feeling that we ought to be grateful we're here. It has hit the media recently, you know, uh, with the reparations movement, uh, particularly about the fact that uh, we should be grateful that we came here and therefore we shouldn't want uh, reparations, okay? And so you are talking about this whole issue of gratefulness too, and I think that it, uh, we, we can be helped by your discussion because the average African-American uh, 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 doesn't know how to deal with that whole, whole issue. And so again, I think that we can uh, assist each other with that. Okay, I'm going to come to my brother, but let me take this brother in the back where I hands up. Go ahead, my brother. Oh, yeah, I just want to say, oh, as far as oh, resistance writers, it's louder. as far as resistance writers, I'm not sure, as you mentioned, 
you know, there you mentioned few, but res people of resistance in Austria. I gotta say this. I have to give you <laughs> one of those positions because in my mind, when you were asked an impromptu question, whether you believed electoral politics was a means of change, you responded very quickly with no. And in this culture, and African Americans particularly in this country, we have been sold this lie that somehow we can obtain our freedom. I ain't talking about assimilation. I'm not talking about a better job, a position, but to gain our freedom, many of us are, are under the influence, the deceptive influence, that yes, we can obtain our influence through electoral politics. And I'm just saying that because as I listened to you speak, you spoke, I think you called it the spring movement that happened? Operation Spring. Operation Spring. I immediately saw when you mentioned it that the, the similarities to, to Cointel Pro, and I said to myself, "Boy, I don't know what came first, Nazism or American racism." Why are they different? Be, you know, <laughs> and, and, and so, so it's hard to tell: is the Austrian government getting it from Nazism, or getting it from what America, or both? So I'm under the influence now that that. What, where you are in Austria seems to be where we were. And I'm wondering that out of all the black resistance movements, particularly the Black Panther Party, is that well known or is it just the media image of what, what, they, what we portray here? The BLA, the BLA organization, the Black Liberation Army, is that known at all in Austria? Because you can use some of our mistakes and some of our positive yeah. things mm -hmm. to help your own resistance since you're at that level it seems that where we used to be when that happened to us and where we are probably still today. Um, okay, that, that was um, a lot of questions and comments. I tried to keep everything. Um, concerning the black part of Excuse uh, me, by the way, let me interrupt you. Those of you leaving, excuse me, let me tell you something. These sisters are going to take, we're going to try to enable them to take a lot of the, it's not only telling them what they didn't read. We're going to now make sure here at Sankofa give them 30% off to take books that we believe they should take with them. And this is the reason of our event. Our event is that we make sure our voice has gone through them to other folks. And that you contribute. We're going to have this Ethiopian basket here. Very good luck basket. And you're going to put what you can in here though, we, so we can buy them books and videotapes to take. There's a Black Panther uh, documentary film they will take, etc, etc. So it's always very important. I'll tell you quickly because I'm seeing some people leaving. I have been 30 years involved with the issue of black people in Europe. You don't know how they torture them. Here, a black kid can go to a black school unless you decide to send them to be tortured for experience. Mm -hmm. They can go to a black school, historically black school. Mm -hmm. There, the little boys and girls are sent to white racist schools. And when they feel racism, they're taken to a psychiatrist to be diagnosed and relegated dysfunctional for life. Mm -hmm. I have met painfully black little girls and boys in Germany that were brutalized by silent fascism. And you don't know how it feels to connect with them. 30 years ago, I was in Berlin showing a film, Bush Mama. There was one little black girl, about 13, in the back of the auditorium. And I'm intellectually feuding with these white people about movie making. And she came at the end of the film and said to me, I didn't want to ask you in front of him because I am here physically, but I'm a tortured soul. She started crying. I'll tell you. Anyway, sometimes we look at bigger things and lose the small things. Little black kids are lost in front of the television in America when the television station makes them hate their hair. You lose your daughter. And I'll tell you, anyway, the, fund, the funding is key, 
And so we bring them not to entertain you, not to have like this cultural uppity class to create. We're just saying connect. Connect. You don't know how, how related. The more global, globalism goes the way it goes, and the way we know our folks, wherever they are, their power in time of up, uprising. Their power. But we shouldn't know about each other. They should read so much. You don't know how much books I take to Germany to black kids when I go. Because I want them to read. And you don't know how much they appreciate a strong poet just writing poetry without apology that I think African Americans consent to. And all the way to South Africa, you don't know tortured little kids. And, and, so I'll just say to you, one, I'm going to show, in my new film I finished in Ethiopia and Germany, I'm going to I was trying to surprise her. I'm going to show you a scene. And then she will have to talk after the scene that she had played. Because how I got her was, you know, I was choosing all these actors in Germany. There was budget to pay and things. But I looked, I looked in the magazine and I chose her in the back of some crowd, like here. I said, that I think is the sister I want. We got her in Aust Austria. Because she was not an actress. I don't take actresses. They're fake and phony. I don't work with them. So I found a real organic sister. And that's Araba. And you'll see her. So do not go without doing this. That's what I'm saying, since some people are leaving. Now, if you want to take the answer uh, on the question of, like, I think he's right. To me, there's a whole lot of African-American resistance literature uh, that goes one way or another, it finds itself there. And certainly, the sisters who wrote showing our, showing our colors you know, knew and understood and had a link to African-American uprising. And Angela Davis, by the way, is a very important icon in these isolated racist places. They used to carry her picture when she emerged in history. And so there's a very uh, wordless, sometimes I even, made, I mean, I discredited by words. There's some feelings there. Before answering the question on, on, on the Black Panther Party, I just there, there's something um, that this, um, this is this is something that that um, is very important for us to also break this invisibility to show you that there is black people all around the world in in Austria, but also in places like Switzerland and Sweden and Finland, and just to acknowledge the presence as such is something that um, is very empowering. And just to be asked about um, in, in those places where black people are not um, thought to be. Um, concerning the Black Panthers, yes, the, um, the, the Panthers have an, are a big inspiration um, in many different ways. Um, I, I, tr um, I mentioned that earlier that in, 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 in um, the revolutionary, uh, like the black revolutions in America have been a source of inspiration for us. Yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. His household, you know. Uh, <laughs> like yesterday, furniture. by the like way, the Bamboo Station was here doing music, so I take you for granted. Go ahead. That, uh, sisters, first of all, thank you again for coming and sharing your experience and you know, enlightening us. Uh, like Haile said, it's, it's very important for us to come together uh, as black people, regardless of our cultural or linguistic differences. We have to look past that. It's, it's, this is time. Um, I really inspired, I was really uh, moved when you said that uh, black people, they are, are, are inspired or influenced by black resistance here in North America. Uh, first of all, you know, as a child who grew up in the 60s and 70s, you know, I, I was touched by that and saw a lot of that, yeah, 60s and 70s. <laughs> <laughs> but also, uh, I'm saddened a little bit because uh, in working with a lot of youth and in detention centers and different urban centers here around, around uh, you know, here in this area, around the states, it seems a lot of that fervor, a lot of that fire, that focus, that direction is, is being watered down uh, in the course of integration. And I say that because, uh, I don't know if the brother's still here, but there was a discussion we had right here in the cafe and the, and the youth was saying something like, you know, race doesn't really matter anymore. He's about 15. And, and, and his viewpoint to me reflects that a lot of those, uh, I don't know, those gains, a lot of those a lot of that focus, somebody has been kind of watered down with, with our younger generation and that they, they're not as connected with our struggle 
as, as youth once were. They're not as informed. You know, youth today, right now today, I'll tell you, you know, Martin Luther King or, or Malcolm X didn't have anything to do with me. Black youth will tell you that. So I'm curious about, uh, on your side of the water, what are the generational differences in, in, in terms of just struggle or orientation or connection with this struggle between the, you know, say your parents and, and, and you today? Part of what we did is how we embedded our work. Um, we wanted to always make it accessible. That's like something that we that was always um, very important for us. Um, also in the course of Let It Be Known. And um, that was definitely a way of reaching young people. They were, um, through, through rap and through the video, through the imagery. Um, young, um, we, um, we do workshops with kids and there is a lot of hunger and thirst for, 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 uh, for these issues. So it's definitely something that, um, of course, it's, you'll have people that will say they're not interested or has nothing to do with them, but I mean, personally, I've just had the experience that there's very eager people. Um, very, um, I'm very, I can say I'm really very proud of our um, youth in, in Pomoja, and they're also willing to spread the word. We had an event in Black History Month where there were other younger sisters and brothers, you know, telling each other um, about the N word, saying, you know, don't use the N word, and what. And I just thought that, wow, you know, this is really going on what we're doing, and we're reaching people. And I think that there's a lot of um, even quite young children. They just, um, just, just to be with other black people just triggers so much. And um, and generation. I mean, I think. Okay. I think I misunderstood the question. Did I? <laughs> a gen yeah, the genera um, generation um, difference. Um, I think you you want to talk about that with the Ghana Union and this. Sorry. Go ahead. I think the question was generationally as well, if there's a difference. Would you like to add something on that? If go ahead. You go ahead. To, to <laughs> I'm just that. talking so much. Go ahead. No, no, don't worry. No, go ahead. Um, generationally, there's, um, like maybe from our parents' generation, it's maybe more the classical Kwame Nkrumah, Lumumba, in the best sense of the word, like as, as role models, I would say. And then maybe the, um, the younger generation tends more to Malcolm X and in this in this way, but it's not like a big conflicting, it's not really bigly conflicting, I would say. There's not such a gap, like you described, that this is really um, like a very big gap of different role models, I would say. Okay, my brother now. I just want to thank you for coming here. You're Louder, my brother. Yes, I want you. I want to thank you too for coming here and sharing. It's very encouraging. Uh, it's it, there's just so many places to go with this. One thing that's important in your Pan African spirit, um, we made reference about giving you resources. J. A. Rogers from the Harlem Renaissance. I'm old enough. My parents always had me to read. Here's a man from Jamaica who was in the American experience with the diaspora. And he wrote about how some of our scholars went over to Austria and Germany and were viewed as exotic and were given permission as, as being exceptional examples. Um, a lot of our scientists, for instance, there's a famous black biologist, Ernest Everett Jess, who Rogers talks a lot about, who studied over in Vienna, just to give you an example of that. And so it would be that would be an important resource, but um, the reason I mention this is uh, just to hear about your struggle in dealing with German and Austrian culture, cultures that made it a point in their colonialism to really extract our aesthetics, our resources, our historical records. And so it's, it's to me, I just want to affirm you and say it's very important for you to continue in your resistance, and I, and I thank you for that. In fact, I want to say more when you were asking them because they've been hiding. I think we should confront them and ask them, you know, you don't just suddenly start to be fighting for the identity no. and yes. dignity. What happened to these two folks <laughs> personally? You know, what happened? We want to hear that too a little bit so we can know them more. <laughs> so we should start about... Yo, how did you get, what, what made you like... You could be working in a bank, you know. You don't have to stop on suddenly on, you know, to fight for this whole idea of our identity. You know, there's many boardrooms opened where you could 
do janitorial work, whatever. What, did, what made you go this way? And I, I think that's important. What happened to you? What's the personal story here? Well, for me, a starting point was, was my school experience. Um, being in the classroom and being, um, just being confronted with, um, with an image of Africa that is, is e equivalent with um, underdevelopment. Um, yeah, and I felt helpless in this very situation, helpless to defend myself. And this was a sort of helplessness I could not stand. And I realized that I'm, I'm, I'm internalizing. I felt it's unjust, it's wrong, but I didn't have anywhere to go with that. I didn't have the knowledge to resist that. I just knew it hurt me, it put my, resist, my existence down, it um, smashed me down. That's what I knew, I knew the pain, but I didn't know how to resist. Um, so for me, that was um, the starting point for my decision to, to do African studies very naively at that point, because in, 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 um, in Europe, African studies has a different history that African American studies has. It's, it's embedded in colonial history. I mean, it, it's embedded in the history of studying the others so we can oppress them better. So it was a very naive decision to do African studies to go back to my roots and learn about myself. But I started with going to Ghana. That was my starting point to um, to go to Ghana. It was the first time I consciously visit Ga visited Ghana because I was two years old. That's why, I mean, I wasn't unconscious, but I was too <laughs> small to, to remember that. Um, so this has really been um, so much of who I am today, being in Ghana. I was 18 years at that time. I did my first year at university in Legon. Um, and yeah, that was, that was really that. That was the first time I was told I was beautiful, um, and not in a way that exoticized me as a special species that's very tall and very interesting, but really in a genuine way. Um, so that really had a very strong impact for me. And another point was when I, I lived in Austria, and this was something that's very common for us. Austria is not a place for us to be, that's how we feel. So none of us sees ourselves as st um, really staying in Austria. The dream is going to pl real places where there's black people, like maybe to the States, or I mean, state is a big dream to live in the United States and with brothers and sisters and in the cool culture. And um, or, <laughs> as I've seen, or maybe in England or France, places like that. So I was not seeing myself as staying in, in Austria. So I wanted to do African <coughs> studies and I stayed in London and I thought I'll stay there. And I was always asked um, when I said, like, where do you come from? Like, and I said I came from Austria. People were completely shocked, brothers and sisters. What? There's black people in Austria, black people in Hitler's country? And they asked me, how is it? And I told them a few of the things that I told you now, like how it was. One thing I also forgot, like in summer, there's an ice cream. I like chocolate. But this ice cream, um, like um, topped with chocolate, is called N ice. So that was one of the struggles, how to get. Anyway, so um, I told them those stories, ten little ends and this and this, and then I got sick and tired of talking about those stories, and I asked myself, what have you done to change that? If it bothers you so much, you, you tell them how bad it is, but what have you done to do that? And I realized by telling and talking to, reaching out to other brothers and sisters in, in England that I'm not alone. It's not just my story. There's brothers and sisters in Austria that share my story. So I came back, consciously came back to Austria, that this would be an escape to just stay in England and say, oh, there's a ready-made community, and you know, it's, it's different. So um, in this spirit, that was 1996, um, there were a lot of us in this spirit of, we have to organize ourselves. Something has to change. And that was the spirit in the start of, of um, of um, organizing Pamoja, that's how Pamoja together came into being as with, with this starting point. And yeah, so I think that, that says something from that point. Well, um, I was actually born in London and um, I, I spent um, a few years when I was a child in Nigeria and then came back to England and then when I was 14 I moved. <laughs> 
when my when my when my life really began, like when things started happening, I moved to the Austrian countryside. So I was dragged, but it was for me it was really being dragged because it wasn't my choice. My my mum moved um, over there, and. Um, uh, for me, my image was just, Austria is just a white country and I am, my brother and my sister and I, we're the only black people. For me, it wasn't for the entire country, that's the feeling I had. Because um, we, had, we had been there in the holidays and um, I had just constructed this, um, this uh, image that that's how it is. And um, it was also very similar to the school experience. Um, I think that's a common, quite a common experience for, for many um, black people in Austria. And um, when, I'm, uh, when I uh, started, when I was um, able to study, I, uh, I had to leave, I left the area and I, everything I did was just to get away from the countryside really. And then I went to Vienna and um, I really wanted to find out um, where are black people. And that's something that I did notice when I went to bigger cities, oh, there are, um, there are brothers and sisters, but it was something that was always very painful because um, seeing seeing other brothers and sisters was um, um, like there were brothers of them that were mainly from Nigeria selling um, selling pictures, like selling these paintings, and uh, people would always close their doors and lock them when they were coming to the doors. So you see um, you see part of you see who you are, and and at the same time you see how people were reacting. So it's something that we we distanced ourselves from, and um, I remember. For the first time, um, yeah, seeing seeing black people as other people and not as myself, or trying to not see them myself. And um, but then, as I got older, I just had this longing. I felt like I wasn't a full person. I felt um, that that something is missing. So when I got to Vienna, that's when I um, that's when I uh, started doing research. Actually, I was looking um, when I start. I also studied. I studied cultural social anthropology thinking. That's a way of um, getting to know about you know other cultures in the sense of being able to. Yeah, so and then my, the first paper I wrote was on um, on Afro Austrians and I did research and that's how I actually got to Pogoja and since um, since I um, I've just shown interest and also get this different perspective because we at university we're just really fed um, with this. Um, we're force-fed with this um, um, so-called knowledge, and and, and um, for me it was always it was always important to uh, for now for my studies because um just to get this different perspective into it. So a lot of the work that I've done with Pomoja has very strongly affected my studies and how I want to get out of it because I still study cultural and social anthropology, but I but it's it's a whole different um, um, view on it because I can. Um, look back on different literature and um, other stories and uh, kind of a, a counter history of, of um, a counter approach to what what um, I get so that's yes and since then <laughs> there have been many opportunities and it was quite it was quite a big break and I think that all of us um, really feel through Pomoja that um, we've got so much stronger and there's so much that we can still do. Well, I want to say something before everybody, like sh showing our colors, we'll, we'll bring it, we're going to order it, we'll bring it here. But we hope people read that book. If you want to talk about the sterilization of black women during the Nazi era, black people's history, by the way, there were many stories now coming out in terms of concentration camp. Nobody cared even to count them or write about them. and so. That book is very important to know. I just want to say one thing to everybody, and then I want to go to Clarence here, uh, because he's written a lot on this issue. It's very good. We're very glad you are here. He's not only hiding in the university. You know, we're getting him in the community. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, I'll tell you, when I go to Germany, I'm surrounded by black Germans, what's called black, I call black Germans, but Afro-Germans. It goes through changes, this naming thing. And I remember, if I go to Frankfurt, if they know I'm in town, I'm surrounded. And it's not for anything. I didn't do any Hollywood movie. I did militant film. And they think I'm their, I'm their older brother. And most of them are very painful, pained people. And I want to tell you one kid who will never forget. He sat quiet in this whole crowd of people talking, excited. This, What's happening in the movie I was making was also trying to graft some of this story that touched me. And so there was this brother who was quiet and he said to, you know, I said, everybody's talking, what about you? And everybody suddenly is quiet and 
apparently he stutters. So he t starts to talk and he's locked. And as he's crying, he told me he was like three or four year old, four years, when his African father abandoned him. And then his mother gave him to a foster home and he stuttered from then on. He couldn't talk. If you see this guy, you can never, never tell people, I have never succeeded to tell them how he can't come out of me. And so I remember in America, like you come to Washington, nobody, like everybody comes together. But I remember only in white schools in America, black kids surround you like you're going to free them that day. I remember Sankova opened and I was in Harvard. And I'm surrounded by crying black women who excelled like hell to be in that school. Because of what? Silence racism that they never were prepared to face. Although they were qualified to be there, the whole white population thing, they came through the back door on favoritism. And that itself becomes the most fascist thing to subject a little, you know, young sister who just finished college. This is what you see in Europe. This is what happens to black people in Europe. And so, I would say this, they got to take Asada with them at least three, four copies. They got to take George Jackson three, four, five copies. Because to me, when I read George Jackson is when I realized that I could do better in life than this stuff I'm involved in, Hollywood movie and actors, it, it liberated me. Malcolm X autobiography has done so much to continental Africa. They tell you, when did you start thinking about racism? The time I read his autobiography. Not even like Alex Haley wrote everything, you know, there's many missing chapters. Still, Malcolm comes out. And so we got to give them the information they need. After all this talking, you know, my wife and me are action oriented. Otherwise, we'll be looking for the next contract somewhere in New York or LA. We wouldn't be with you guys. This liberated territory is action. And we can say, you see, whatever we want to say, at least, until the fence. Yes, 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 Name um, more titles, write it, give us, even if we send it in the future, sure, we'll yes. send it. We also have some Damu's book we're going to send there. Mm. Damu Smith's book. Yeah, uh, a couple of things. One, I, I really want to echo everybody's sentiment of welcoming you guys here. And as I sit here and listen to this, I realize this is one of the most important events we're going to have in our community this year. Right. Making this kind of links and these kinds of connections oh, is yeah. so rare. And so for us to kind of take this step really is a historic uh, moment. And as Heidi mentioned, I spent a lot of time in Germany. I used to live in London uh, and a little bit of time in Austria. And I knew Maya. And she was, uh, you're absolutely correct, Showing Our Colors was not only a powerful book for Germany, but for the black diaspora as a whole. And I actually used to use it in my classes, but I haven't been able to get it in years. No, we're getting it. We're getting okay, because it. it's yeah. a book. Cause this is my other point, which doesn't contradict the point that people have been raising, but that we need to read literature from other places oh, as yes. well. Yes. And this is one of the problems that there's great literature coming out of Africa, coming out of Europe, coming out of Latin America, and we need to, to read that. A lot of it's in English, uh, but a lot of it's in languages that we should learn. Mm -hmm. We should know some Spanish, we should know some German, we should know some Portuguese. Uh, but there are two issues uh, I wanted to raise and get, get you guys' uh, views on. Uh, I just took a group of students to Brazil uh, a couple of weeks ago for spring break and we were down there looking at Afro-Brazilian issues and we went to uh, people who were working with AIDS, people who were doing community groups, people who were doing stuff around media, people who were working just kind of at the grassroots level, people with condom blay houses and at every single meeting we had the one issue that came up was about Obama and their view was literally Obama is a hope. And when we ask them, well, you know, what can, what's going to happen in your country? And they're like, well, mm -hmm. that depends on whether Obama gets elected or not. And so I understand the, and, and in the last six months or so, many people I've talked to just around the world for a lot of different work I'm doing are starting to get on this kind of Obama hope. 
And I understand that inspiration that people feel in the sense that this is a black person, somebody with an African father, who's at the highest pinnacle of U.S. politics. What's somewhat disturbing, though, is there's an illusion under that as well yes. that Obama yes. can become president, and he actually might, that he can become president and that this would be some kind of change. So part of what I'm interested in is how uh, the Afro-Austrian community is reading Obama in, in, in political ways. And then related to that, how is the Afro-Austrian community also linking up with other black communities uh, in other parts of Europe as well as in other parts of the diaspora, like in Latin America, for example? But I also I want to challenge this brother here. He needs to do what we're doing here more effectively. He can do once a month this linkage capable capacity I've known him for 30 years I'm sure he should be doing this not sure we can be old folks okay but I think you should do the linking really once a month we'll give you the whole place Go ahead. Okay, well, I, I will. thank you that's good but I, I could I also just black Hitler's blacks victims so this is a book. We've had Clarence here in the store before, but I think we should do another book signing with yeah. him here so he can talk about his work in this area. Very this good. is his book. Very yeah. good. Um, like, concerning the question how um, the connection between, did I understand, like, connection? No, the Obama. Obama, okay. The Obama issue. Uh, Obama issue. Um, there's different positions to that. By the way, don't be scared. Obama. Don't be scared. Nobody would, if you are pro of Obama or not, nobody would do nothing to you. <laughs> Except me, of course, but... <laughs> because you, you asked the question very broad, like in general, um, like blacks in, in, in Austria. There's different positions to it. Like um, there's pan-African posi pan Africanist positions to it that say it's not about, the dream is not to be part of the system. So, um, so they see from this point of view, and then there's points of views that really find it very exciting and follow me, follow it very much. For some reason, in Europe, there's a lot of attention on Obama. Even in Germany, in Austria, the very, um, yeah, the very. I mean, I won't say pro Obama, but it's it's interesting, and it's interesting to look at the reason why it's it's happening. But they're very much there's much coverage on that topic. Um, Obama and um, so um, we had very tough discussions on that too um, if that's you know if, if that's hope or not so it really depends on uh, if you have more pan <laughs> position or if you have more of a, um, like if integration is your dream so there's not one view on it but different contested um, feels on it um, concerning the connections in, in the African diaspora it is very strong but I think it's something we already mentioned that Mayim has been a very uh, big source of inspiration. There's a, a strong linkage to the black, the black movement in Germany as well. I see, I see a very strong connection. But also, there's there's also a union called Sankofa in in um, Switzerland, with which we also have strong ties. So there is a very deep and, and long tradition on that. Yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think the, the question's been answered, but the, there was also um, one example of uh, a connection. There was um, there was um, a company um, that that um, organized an African village in 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 Germany, and they actually organized it in a zoo. They they had this um, ex kind of exhibition. You could uh, they did like hair braiding and uh, making um, African. Um, uh, um, vases and, and all sorts of things and they um, made it in a zoo and um, um, Initiative Schwarze Deutsche um, which is um, the movement in Germany uh, demonstrated against this and um, the same company uh, organized something in Vienna called the Afrika Tage which is like African days and um, uh, it wasn't in the same background but we knew we found out that it was that um, the same organization and we organized a, um, a protest, and um, we went there, and um, 
Arab actually talk to them to the man who was in charge there, and we could also refer to to the fact that we we know of this um, that this happened in Germany, and it's something that was also in um, in um, community media as well. And I thought that it, um, I mean that was really a moment where you could show we are connected, and it's not just um, some just a few people in Germany who who are a bit offended, but that they that the people are connected and that we're standing against this. I wanted to say something on Obama because that was something that we there was a, a meeting I came to yesterday some of the brothers are also <coughs> present and, and this was a discussion and I was very much interested in the discussion that was going on uh, positions on Obama and um, what I found also interesting because when we discuss that in Austria it's more theoretical it's like it is it is a more of a, a theoretical question so what I would also be interested in is, is um, in general, like what are the practical steps? Like, is the question of, of not going to the election or not, or the, like really on a pla practical level. And um, if, even if you say it's not um, like, elect, like it's not through election that revolution will happen or freedom will happen, it can also not just be Obama or nothing. So this would be something, I think this would be maybe too much for, for now, but this would be something we would very much be interested in like very practical um, positions that you've been working on thinking about <coughs> strategies, um, demands, or yeah. Okay. Well, let me say something. Uh, my, you know, my um, sister that's been mentioned a lot. I know a very well, cl very close friend. We were in Ghana together. This sister, when she was in kindergarten. She, went, she was in a white school, in this whole predominant white school, and the, the children, the game of these young little kids goes like this. What would you do if a black man comes? Uh, and then the chorus, the little kids would say, uh, I would run. And then it goes on to say, but how about if he follows you, then he's going to eat you, he's going to chop you, he's going to... It's an amazing, amazing, unbelievable children's song that every little kid in Germany sing. And then you put... It's not about Germans singing, but there's one little girl in the room playing the game and finding out she is the one they will always make the African who comes into this narrative to eat them. And they'll be hiding, shaking under table, etc. It's a hide and go game kind of play. And I have met people who are psychologically damaged by this, this children's song alone. And my am, I think she had written a lot about this whole thing. Her, in the, it's not only the book, we're trying to get a documentary made about her. And if you happen to go to Berlin, I go to only three graveyard sites, my mother, my father, and Maya in Berlin. In Berlin, I go to her grave because she's so meaningful to me. Not because she did a pyramid, what she went through, what she stood, and then she rose to be this amazing poet in Germany. And so it's a very important name. We hope to get the film again. Now, so I would, one book I would recommend, I think, which would make some life somewhat easier in terms of what you're doing at this time, and that is a book that's recommended by one of our uh, historians, John Henry Clark, and that's the book called The Shadow of the Third Century, A Reevaluation of Christianity. I think you will find that quite helpful, especially with what's going on in America right now with the religious right and the evangelicals. The other uh, book or author I would recommend who has several volumes and from what I've heard you two say about race and especially with the area you're working in the lady on the right uh, Gerald Massey is a person who did a lot of work in England and his books are now available in fact you'll find it on a shelf back here and I think it'll be invaluable for what I'm hearing from you two so I'll start with his first book It's three two volume uh, books the first two volumes called the book of the beginnings and then the second two volumes would be the natural genesis where he improves upon book of the beginnings and then the last one which is his classic is called ancient Egypt the light of civilization you'll see where this is a person who spent his last 30 years of his life going into Africa and takes you into the heart of Africa 
and shows that that which you're seeing throughout the whole world, the myths and all of that associated with religion, comes out of Africa. I think it will be a, be a great help to you with the work that you're doing. There's other works, but I know other here will recommend. I don't want to take up a lot of time, but just from what I've heard today and from my own experiences, I worked with a company where we had Africans from all over Africa, and the difficulty we had in working with one another, why? Some were from the French Francophone countries, the others were from uh, the German colonization. Those things make it very difficult for us to communicate. And then within America, we have our own problems here from slavery when they broke it up into different religions. So for you to get a better understanding of who we are and we of you, I think those would be good starting points. You. You're welcome. By the way, uh, the hidden hand, uh, wife, that I refer to my wife, she's saying it's very important people shout for uh, books, names of books, and the video because these are precious books to us. They're not, you know, the New York Times bestseller, but our books, you know. Uh, by the way, Jer when Jeremiah Wright's stuff exploded, I was in Germany, and the whole German newspaper had Jeremiah Wright in his dashiki. It was a very, very nice picture. Very nice picture. I didn't know what it was saying in German. Go ahead. You mentioned Jeremiah Wright. Uh, you were asking us for input about Obama, and I will tell you up front, I'm very pro-Obama. But I also know that our liberation doesn't come from the political process alone. So I want to reiterate that point and be very clear about that. Here is a man who is a constitutional lawyer, this nation's constitution. He's a legal scholar and expert. He teaches something called critical race theory. Critical race theory is one of the most subtle intellectual movements. Usually the formula you might be able to hear about it is we have a man named Derek Bell who wrote about if aliens came down and asked for black people to be removed. That's a critical race theory example. So here's a man who's intellectually powerful. He's kind of very vulnerable as far as personal and psychological integrity. And so his minister says something five years ago, and he's forced out of politics. Uh, you know, I don't know how he actually thinks, but he's forced to put political distance for a power source that he could use which is the black religious tradition, which has many forms in this country. So on the surface, you see it as, you know, somebody's forcing him to give account of his pastor. But on another level, one analysis could be, this is what black public intellectuals and black leadership in the mainstream, we're not talking about the radical, more grassrooted, but in the mainstream, here's how they get separated from their power source. You are held accountable for every action, and in this case quite wrongly, that comes from your community. As if you can go into your community and control your pastor, your spouse, your, your kids, your institutions. You know, why people don't give that accountability? Why, why should he? So I just want to give you an example of how complicated things can be, and yet I'm, I'm hopeful, along with many of us, that, that we can take advantage of some of the opportunities that we get. Well, I'll say this. I hope we don't go to the Obama thing. By the way, let me tell you something. Uh, just to juxta juxtapose it with my brother, for me, we also should know the debate of race in a more historical perspective. We know also that he's a custom-made, non-threatening black man. That Finally, white Americans have custom designed somebody they don't, they don't get scared. Now, I'll tell you one thing. I'm, a, I'm from Ethiopia, I'm a foreigner, but I'll tell you one thing. In the dinner plate of America, the white supremacist power structure, if you do not have any link to slavery and the genetic memory of that, you are a non-threatening black person. Now, having said that, do I vote or not? First, I don't care to vote, but I admire anybody who struggles to politically put in place what they want. If Obama becomes president, fine. If he doesn't become, it does. Highly goes on. Looking, <laughs> hey, hey, look, hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Ah, does he go on looking for money, trying to do my next film called The Maroons? Back to bases. Okay? The black bourgeoisie doesn't exist to finance my film. Okay? You struggle, so Obama is not going to come and say, here is a $40 million to make a film about the Jeremiah rights of the swamp of the dismal swamp of Virginia, the Maroons who are burning 
white plantations, mm -hmm. it's not gonna happen. So for me, black people's interests still should never be compromised, whatever the class negotiation is. So the Obama thing, I think Clarence was more interested, not because I don't wanna go to that, because I really don't die hard to defend nobody. I didn't do it during Jesse Jackson. Oh, he had the genetic things yeah. that threatened the hell out of him. But I didn't get into it because to me, one White House person, if he can make history to change America's crime, then there was never crime anyway. There was never genocide. There was never exterminated Indians, Africans, imported slaves. The founding fathers are the criminals of this country that left the legacy of crime. How can one person erase it? No. But I still would not want us to go there. His question is what do they think about Obama? Because I'll tell you, South African coloreds, for example, have a different take in Ob on Obama. Yes. You gotta know that. There's this thing, especially with those of us who are a little bit light-skinned, we know the possibilities, extents we can go with these things also if we choose so. And so there's a whole lot of dynamics, but I think the sisters more, okay, for me, are our connections beyond Obama, really. For me, there are connections before Obama because you would always want somebody somewhere having an organizational site for little black kids to go and feel normal. That's the first torture we have to stop. That black kids should not be made to hate their nose, their lips, their hair. That's silent fascism. We, wherever we are, should fight. They represent to me, I, you know, Forcefully, they have not yet stated because they might end up crying. But I'll tell you, the brutalization of black girls and boys in Europe is so severe, I am a very angry person. I have known 14 and 12 year old kids completely disoriented. Suicide has taken place. I'm gonna, I have a book here on German written. A kid, 11 year old kid, killed himself than take the torture and the crucible of racism. And so, today is like a, I mean, Obama, fine, but I don't think you should go to that. Although, if they want, I don't mind. You mind to go? Huh? Ancient and modern Britain, David McRitchie, because it talks about the black invasions from different directions into Europe and parts of, he spends in the second volume, I believe, a large amount of time talking about why black into their fairy tales became so bad and why they're still afraid of that black man to this day. My brother, I said Obama is a neo-colonial puppet. Okay. Uh, second of all, uh, I've heard you say several times, uh, Brother Holly, that <coughs> You're you're really uh, you're really concerned about you know the the Africans in Europe that have been you know tortured psychologically and, and these things really disturb you and uh, it sounds like a it sounds like a real serious you know what I'm saying uh, you know and why well, you know what I'm saying I I hear I hear a lot of I hear a lot of people talking. Uh, I, you know what I'm saying? I've, I've heard a lot of people speak today, you know what I'm saying? And, and you know, I feel like uh, what's going on right here, you know, in the United States with the Africans, you know what I'm saying, is, is, I mean, you know, I see Africans in this room that are acting like they shocked to hear some of these things, or, or, or as if they're learning something, you know, I, and, and it confuses me, you know what I'm saying? Because I, I don't see, I don't see, we, we, we in D.C. right now, which is the poorest city in America, has the 51st ranked school system in America, you know what I'm saying, has the highest HIV AIDS rate in America, you know what I'm saying, has the highest level of lead contamination in the water in America, and the power center of the world, you know what I'm saying? This, this is a giant plantation that we, that we sitting on right now in a liberated space on a giant plantation. So I'm I'm really confused about you know, like, you know what I'm saying? What what what? I I, I just I'm I'm sorry. I'm I'm a little frustrated, but you know, can't ain't nothing going on nowhere. I you know what I'm saying? I am not as I'm not as traveled as as maybe a lot of people here. You know what I'm saying? But I've been enough places, and 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 you know this is this is uh, you know, my 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 life is at stake here. So I so I take you know. I take with all seriousness, uh, 
I, I, I can't I can't I can't imagine I, I hear qualitative differences but I can't imagine any hell being any worse than the one that I grew up in in West Philadelphia you know what I'm saying so you confusing and disturbing to me some of the you know some of what I'm hearing uh, well you know, let me just say to you my brother since I'm older than you you better get ready to be confused more because black people are the most you can see take, you've taken us as an example we're the most confused people but I think out of that confusion comes the focus always it takes time it skips years it skips don't be frustrated if we're not with you but there will be historical circumstances. Everything out of focus becomes focus. Mm. I, 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 I mean, impatience has no place in the struggle. Mm. Confusion, yes. Mm. Impatience, no entitlement. I cannot be impatient. Mm. All I know is black folks from here <laughs> to Africa are crazy. I start there. <laughs> then I say, but I know, like me, because if I changed, everybody will change. Yeah. That's the premise. I know if I can be a useful member of a society, other people in certain better circumstances will be better than me. And I think the most socially conscious people, your job is not, I think, it's not a romantic thing to be, this. Now I'm going to go beyond you now, I'm just going to talk general. You have no right to be disillusioned unless you are romantic to begin with. You have no right, otherwise revolution skips generation, but your job is in the moment you lived, did you leave a pamphlet of your thought system? But if you think your pamphlet will be read today and the world will follow you, look at my movies. Every movie <laughs> I've made, they're simple pamphlets, yeah. but the people are not yet born to read it and implement it. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, you will survive. Otherwise, you'll be lonely and suicidal. <laughs> this is my view. To me, otherwise, that's how I go. Otherwise, when I say, how come with all these rich black people, I have to take 14 years to do a movie, it's beyond me. But I said, hey, that's why this movie is about this. That's the subject matter. So be hopeful, my brother. I know you do homework. I've seen you a lot here. You do study. But do not even let you depart from my folks are crazy. My, can you imagine Lumumba? His own people choking and dragging him. Can you imagine what kind of camera can go in his head to really tell us how he felt? You know, Malcolm X just be shot by his own people. I don't care who sent them. I'm not interested in Hoover or anybody. What kind of black man shoots Malcolm? And then, what was in his head? And not even his own kids could give you that because it's a mystery of the struggle. And so, keep going, don't be frustrated, but start from craziness. <laughs> I teach at Howard, it is a crazy <laughs> house. But I prefer Howard than Harvard. Yeah. Because I see some young, brilliant kids that I see every now and then that make even me be better and be committed. And so it's reciprocal. And so, I, I know you know this, I'm just saying, in case you got low, because I sometimes feel lonely myself, you know? I don't know how to deal with my own family because I say, why is no money for me to do my movie? Yeah. Yeah. You know? But if I do, if I want to do pornographic, hey, I even have sisters who'd line up, brothers who'd line up, and they would even call me the new pornographic black filmmaker who discovered Columbus new, you know? <laughs> That's the way the world is. The superficial blacks that say, he is our Columbus in nudity. You know? So uh, that's why I said earlier, he, this, this brother with this white woman, okay? A mental King Kong would not have lived a day in 1968, 69. And it's not by black people who are street. It's a black guy who was on his way to work. And he doesn't see work at Sears over his people's degradation. He stops where he is. Like the black man who saw black women be messed around in the plantation and then say, I can't do nothing about it. I will die here standing for something. See, the problem is those stories have never been told. I live with them every day upstairs, the maroon stories. People who decided from day one, they wouldn't live one minute beyond having lost their dignity as human beings. So we live with a lot of zombies now, wearing our skins. But that's not the history makers. These are the roughages. We are the roughages of history. And so I, I am not, I am not, I remember one time we were doing the Women 1010 film. A sister who was just like militant, quick militant, she just said, highly, she came to her and said, 
the struggle is really lonely. I just looked at her and I said, what right do you have to even utter this word, this word, lonely? How do you know the sisters who are now, who are fighting for a tap of water in, in Georgia, what do you know about you know, the Gucci sisters from my sister's place? You don't know nothing. They're fighting developers there and you're sitting here at Howard telling me it's so lonely because some brothers and sisters didn't see what you saw immediately. And so this is just, I want to say, to encourage you, my brother. Go ahead. You said your hands up. Okay, sister, the quiet one. Yeah, yeah, you. Quiet. <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to, to again reiterate and, and thank you for, for speaking here today. Um, I'm originally from Lynchburg, Virginia, and so it's a city that's predominantly white but has a significant black community. And so, you know, I had this experience growing up in, in high school. I was at first with, with black students and felt comfortable with that seeing people um, that were like me and I understood that. But as I got older, they have this, this tracking system that removed me from my peers. And so I suddenly ended up in classrooms that were all white. And I don't know what happened, so I, I didn't see my peers anymore. This, the structure of my schedule kept me from seeing them. Um, and it was kind of alienating. I remember being in a European history class, and um, our teacher was like, I want you to go through European history and pick out the person you most admire. And I couldn't come up with anything. And I didn't know what to do. And you know, it was, it was like, do I belong here? Like, where am I supposed to be? What, where, what happened to the community that I was raised in? And as I got older, you know, I was like, okay, I'm going to find the black people, major in African American studies. And, you know, um, it was only until I started to do my own homework that I realized that, you know, there are brothers and sisters in Latin America, there are brothers and sisters in Europe, they're all over the world, you know. And so I, now I try to go out and I try to travel and see. And the, the thing that um, is the struggle is language, you know. So I was like, okay, so I need to learn languages. I need, you know, how do I communicate with people? I need German, I need Portuguese, I, need, I want to understand. Joy Dinalani's song, like, how do I do that? You know, and the, the, the frustrating thing is, like, they're all colonial languages. And so I'm wondering what you guys think about that. How do we build bridges, you know, to, to, to meet and greet and understand each other when we have to, to use a medium that is the language of, of other folk? So I'm interested in your thoughts. Um. I think at the same time there's there's a lot of connection too already, the, and um, I really don't know how it is. Um, I see I don't know I see a lot of I, I don't know I just see more the connection that is existing, and we are able to read so much and see so much. So we I I, I come more from the other side of, of not the division that separates us but the connection and do we really live up to the whole potential of what is connecting what is connecting us? There's so many um, there is obstacles but there's so many things that we're not um, stopped from doing but maybe it's our own internal separation that keeps us from looking across. And maybe Spanish now, you know. Yeah. So in, in terms of like being able to, I think that um, it's it's you have to be intentional. You have to decide to learn another language to be able to communicate with with folks. And so um, I'm, I, that's my frustration, you know. Mm -hmm. um, like, and I was just wondering, you know, what it was like on your end um, coming from the idea that that could be wrong that most Europeans learn at least one other language, which, which can build some bridges. I think to meet other I mean, people. Yeah, I mean, is, yeah, English is, is, is funnily enough also used as a, um, sometimes we also borrow English also as a language that carries black history. I mean, that carries this revolutionary history. That when we say black, it carries black, you know, it ca carries black consciousness. So it also works the other way around. That is not just only a colonial uh, language. We also take the language and make it our own and to some extent. So that is also, but I mean, the question of languages is also something we dealt with. We try to also um, um, deal with it, for example, concerning the rap song, it was important also to use African languages. And then the question is, which African languages? But I don't, I mean, it's a very big, big question that we could just sit the whole night on and, and talk. But I'm not really sure if I could, yeah, that's what I can say at this point. This isn't exactly your question, but um, for example, Pigeon English. Is something we also used in um, in our work, 
and um, um, we we even talked about a topic um, of Aryanization about the Nazi period, and we translated it into um, a, a brother translated it into Pidgin English. So making this accessible also to brothers and sisters. Um, yeah, there are not many things you can read in Pidgin English. So. Okay, I'll come to the two of you there. Okay, should we? I need to somebody to load this and get to the scene. Go ahead. Azar. Again, uh, I want to louder. Thank you all for thank you for being here. Um, I just wanted to share a little piece that happened to me recently, um, and wanted to to hear your thoughts on it and to see, um, you know, how you're you're making these connections with enlightening um, the the group that you're with, Pomoja. Um, my younger brother, who was in his early 30s, called me recently, and um, after getting him past the Obama piece um, to, to a piece about uh, being Africans in America, my brother shared with me that um, he told my nephew, his, his son at 11 years old, um, that he wasn't African American, he wasn't even black, he was just an American. And uh, after, you know, in my, in my best way chastising my brother for, for the worst thing I think that he could ever do to my nephew, um, we engaged in, in what was um, a very critical conversation for, for our family on being Africans in America. Um, and we went from my brother saying that he, he didn't want to share this information about being African American or being African to my nephew and his niece and his uh, daughters, um, because it would make them angry, and they would go into the schools, the the predominantly white school system um, that the children are a part of, and they would be angry at white people, and they would just. And I was, I, I shared with him that um, knowledge doesn't breed anger. Knowledge breeds, I mean, knowledge breeds enlightenment. Enlightenment and ignorance, in fact, breeds anger. And, um, and so by the time we got off of the, the phone, my brother was at a space where he was like, you know, you're learning all this stuff and I want to know, so share with me, you know, what, what you're learning. And so I just wanted to find out from you all, um, because it sounds like within the group that you're working with, Pomoja, you're enlightening young people. Um, do you, you know, find some, some of the comments as such that they don't want to have a connection with Africa for whatever reason, Africa is, you know, you know, whatever. Do you, do you find that, you know, with the young people? And then how do you handle it? Well, um, the topic of miseducation is a very strong topic. And, and um, um, the picture of Africa, how it is portrayed um, in the media, in school, in society, is, is a picture that really um, makes African children not want to have anything to do with Africa. So um, this is a starting point. I mean, like I mentioned before, like this, this self-hatred, you know, if you hate Africa, you hate yourself, you end up hating yourself. Um, be it if you're African-American or, or, you know, so I think from a Pan-African point of view, we're all Africans, but I, um, how we try to um, to break that is we started, for example, there was one um, project that we did. We, we um, worked on sheroes and heroes um, that black children could relate to. And um, we, we told the stories about Ya Santawa and included like people of, of the continent and the diaspora, also Mai Yim, um, also Kwame Nkrumah, Lumumba. And for them it was like, uncles and aunties they could relate to and they had stories to do with and it was something practical we had like little buttons that they could choose and they chose the uncle or the auntie which story they liked most or something that they could um, integrate in their everyday life and we did things like um, practical things like t-shirts or things that they could really um, like create heroes and sheroes that are part of their everyday life that you can put on, that you have a story to tell about, something that inspires you in your everyday life. He, if if um, um, Jan Santewa made it before that, I can also do it in this way. I mean, it's it's hard to wrap it up, but this, this the story of miseducation is a very very deep um, deep issue in our context, and um, and also. Um, 
the picture of Africa. Like, just to give you an example, the way I was taught in school about Africa was like, Africa is one country. And, and people asked me if I speak African, which is more than 2,000 languages. So this is the kind of, um, this is the kind of um, picture that is, that is portrayed. So, um, yeah, I think that's from my point. Is there anything you would like to ask? First you, and then the sister. Go ahead, you. I just have a comment. Um, Araba, I'm so happy you're here. I'm so happy I got the chance to meet you and hear what you have to say. And Jadetta, you know I love you. Love I'm so there. happy love you're there. here. Thank you. <laughs> My comment is just to say that this conversation got to a point that was really painful for you both. It's painful for me. I'm sorry that we moved on and we had to stay there longer. I just want to say it was hard. And I don't want you to feel that you were stripped down and then we just moved the conversation on. And you were exposed and we didn't stay there and acknowledge that. I heard you. I think a lot of people heard you. And I just wanted that to be acknowledged and to thank you for doing that. And I'm sorry we didn't stay there longer, but I think maybe it's too painful for us. And I think we should have moved on so quickly. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Um, I had a, one question. Okay, in Austria, um, what is the situation, whereas here in the States, a lot of the struggle is um, not as a parent to young people in our generation. Like, a lot of us just think that it's okay to just get a job, do well, be successful, and that's all you have to do to be a productive black person in the society. Um, but our grandparents and our parents were the ones who saw the ugly part of the struggle. Is it that way in Austria and some of the countries in Europe where the young people still feel the, uh, the need to really be a part of the struggle and really the need to educate themselves? Or is it more a passive thing like we find here in the States in general? She, they didn't get your question. If you were louder, they would or come closer. My question was, um, in in the states, for the most part, with the mainstream young people in in in, in our community, in African American and diasporic community here, most of the time, most of the young people don't really have a sense of urgency or sense of. Um, Need to need for struggle. It's more the everyday. Let me get a job. Let me do my thing. I need to get a house. Those kind of things, rather than it's like a, a materialism and an indi individualism, not a broad-based idea that we all are in a struggle as black people in this country and in the world. Is it is that sense of urgency s still in Austria with the young people, young blacks, or is it more of you're just a small minority of of young black people that are, are are branching out and looking outward and looking at our global our global struggle. Let me just incite them. You know, you know. For example, if you look at the uprising in in France, it's on one hand, it melodically, Europeans in general look like non-racist the way that we look at rednecks here. But it's in the job and employment in in becoming what you want to be. Black folks, in most cases, have no choice, but they're against the, you know, against the wall. Can that help you? The choice is like for job, the choice is, uh, are you really, for example, uh, most Germans, black Germans would tell you their biggest problem is, although they're fluent in German, they asked, are you German? Where did you come from? And these are people who never were, came from nowhere, but were born there. And so they, I don't think they have like, uh, here you can go to a certain community like here and melt. There, it doesn't give you that chance, is my feeling. Go ahead. Um, just, before, just before going to that question, I just wanted to, to thank um, Sister Althea also for 
um, for what you said. Um, it's hard to switch now to the yeah, second I one, but yeah. I do my best. Um, I think what you what you um, what you pictured is is, is um, not so much um, not so much the reality in the Austrian context because there's not so much of um, Selbstverständlichkeit. There's not so much of self-evidence of, of being here, uh, of being in Austria, and um, that's why um, there's so much of everyday struggle in everyday life that th the fact of being the, uh, of, of being in, in Austria as a black person is not self-evident. So there's not so many things that are self-evident that you can sit back and relax to. So there's not so much of a if you want to forget. Um, the realities of, of white supremacy. There's, there's um, not so many zones or places you can just go to. I mean, like, just go to your black community or just go to Sankofa as a spot. We don't have spots like that. We, we have, but we need to organize them. And we need to organize black people being together, like, for example, as a Pomoja meeting. Yeah. But just to give you an example, if we, as a Pomoja, after a Pomoja meeting, there's like 10, 15 black people who walk on the streets, we just get so much stared at just because we are more than like one and it, it's um i think this it, the fact um we now trying to acknowledge what um the generation that came before us like our parents generation has has done and fought for us in a way but there's not so much self evidence in in that sense but the point of question is more also what we um what we discussing on and, and fighting for is also um that the solution cannot not just be leaving Austria and go to another place. That that's more like a question in, in our context. Um, like I mentioned before, it's Austria, um, Austria is not seen as a place where you can really live. So it's, it's the solution would be just to go to the states or, or to go to America uh, to to um, to um, England. So there's the illusion that in, in this other parts of the diaspora, there's not so much racism. That things are much easier in these other parts. I don't know if that answers your question. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, She's going to kill me if I don't. Something beautiful. I'm joking. <laughs> um, your question was kind of like the brother that was sitting right there, but he left. I work with youth. I'm a youth. <laughs> and I work with youth. And from my experiences, it really depends on where you come from. Whereas, like this brother, I'm assuming you was raised like in a neighborhood where you were made aware that you were black. Like you knew it because you knew you didn't have this, that, and the other, whatever. And I think that is a it's a misconception when we say mainstream, because most of us aren't in the mainstream. But it just seems that way because you know, but like the majority of black people, black youth, are in the hood, are in the ghetto. They aren't getting good school. They're not in good education. They're not this, that, or the other. You know. And so I think that. I can't speak, they're not a, just a one group of people, so I'm not going to speak. We're not just one group of people, but I think when, you, when you're trying to get jobs that have already, that black people have already pretty much are, are jobs, like service jobs, and mostly in service. So when you're going into those service industries and things like that, the, the way has already been paid, so you don't have to struggle as much. Because mm -hmm. it's already, it's understood, you're going to come in entry-level position, you're going to be amongst your brothers and sisters, you don't have to struggle for that. But as you try and struggle, if, as you try and climb up that rope and get the, or climb up the ladder or whatever and get different things that aren't given to us already, then you start to see the then you start to see the racism. And so it's like a lot of you, we, we don't have to struggle to watch BET and get this false illusion. But like I'm, I'm doing work in Congress, and I've been at this point I've been put out. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I've been put out because. I was actually working in a, in a representative office that was all white. And I know what discrimination looks like. I know what racism looks like. And because I know that, when I see it, I can speak against it. But when I speak against it, I get sent home. And I don't have any, I don't have any, I don't have anyone to go to and say, look, I've been displeased, I've been whatever. Because it's not, you know what I'm saying? So that's where the struggle comes in. But if I was, if I was back at home working with kids, you know, in school, I don't have to worry about that because it's already understood, okay, you, you know, you, whatever. So I think that, I don't, and I think a lot of youth is exposure. A lot of youth, we stick together. We are all in the cafeteria together. We all are here together. So we don't have to see race because we just, we comfort ourselves. But the minute you step out of that box and you realize, whoa, wait a minute, like, 
you talk to me like I'm crazy and it's cool, but I'll talk to you the same way or like a black, black women, for instance. Like the way I'm talking to you now, if you were white, I would be really aggressive right now. Yeah. And I would yeah. get reprimanded. <laughs> and I'm not, you know what I'm saying? I'm not aggressive. It's just, that's how I've been, I have to be like that to assert myself in certain arenas. And that's how I talk, to, you know? And it's like, oh, you're being insubordinate or you're being disrespectful. I'm not even, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, when you step out of that comfort zone, then as, as we start to step out of our comfort zones, then we'll start to see the, the struggle. Then we'll start to see, oh, wait a minute, things haven't really, because, you know, I was thinking, as long as I'm with my people, it's all good, it's all good. And I was talking to my mother, I'm like, things really haven't changed. And like the whole reason we struggle so hard in Congress and the reason we have so much, some of us are actually trying to, vote for Obama. I don't believe in the, the political system, but I really do respect Obama. I mean, I, I have to respect him, and he might be a puppet, but it's like, I know that from being in Congress, it's strategy, and he can't get out there and be like, black power, woom 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 because he'll never, he won't get any votes. But if he plays that role, if he, if he, if just like Bush did the same thing, who saw Bush coming beforehand, except for people who studied him? He played that role, played that role, as soon as he got in the, to the United States, he just he changed the game on everybody, you know what I'm saying? So I think that that's really what it is. So just keep keep trying to climb that ladder, and you're going to see where your struggle comes in. Okay. Trust and believe. Okay. You know what? There's a program coming up here. And so just quickly, let's show you this thing, this scene, and then we will have them here for all of you to talk to them one by one. I hope you get to talk to them, because some of the things you said, they didn't really couldn't hear it, the noise. but. Those of you who have certain organizations, give them your website. So at least now with this new technology, we can still continue the communications. I'm going to show you this film now. It's now due. I just came back finishing it in Germany. It's out in May. You'll hear it. You'll see it. You'll see it in this screen up there. Can you hit that light, Tesfu? Ignoring the racist society that children have to face sooner or later. Well, it's for your opinion. Why are you so emotional about it? Where do you people think you are? This is Germany. Do you know how a black child is going to feel in this white society? Have you ever thought about this once? I think that you are racist. Oh, now I am a racist? You resent me because I am white and I have tests. And this is what is fucking eating you. You can have both of them, Tess and Amelia. You see me? I know what I'm talking about. You shout down the witness like the rest of society. I'm warning you.
Well, that's just a scene. We're not going to see this whole movie. That's it. Uh, and I'll tell you one just brief thing. This cuts between Ethiopia and this, the, the image is something else. Don't take tribute to you, two sisters here. Uh, hey. I didn't bring anything. Just what is Listen. in there. There is nothing in those books to say how I feel right now, what I've experienced, and what I would really like to say to them. Okay, just okay? say something that at least up and then say that at least. We all of us are it. all of us. Please let me have your phone number, your addresses. I will send you books, I will send you DVDs, I will send you CDs, okay? And I will keep connected with you as strongly as I possibly can. And I'd like to do the same. Yeah. I'll send books. Well, sisters, we, we told them you would come. Okay? They had gone to a white school. I don't want to tell you what happened to them, but I told them they're black people who could even read what they have out of their heads based on genetic experience. And so I'm very proud that you turned up. Thank you. How many people heard Gloria at the PFW for this announcement? Good, good. So she's helping us like hell. And so I want to thank my two sisters for coming, for giving us everything they have, and we hope we'll see them again soon. Thank you again. They'll be, they will be here tomorrow around here, and then, okay. so if you have anything you want to bring to them, okay. please do. We're trying to create a, a container here and just pack them as much as they can take. Gotcha. Thank you again. Thank you for showing up, and really, we're proud of you folks. Thank you. Thank you. What? Well, they want to say thank you, sorry. So here, shout. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you so much.